the Sega CD. Sega's finest specimen, if I do say so myself. Weirdly enough, over the many years I've been collecting, this beautiful baby is what I've become known and attached to. It is the only game system outside the 32X that I have a complete US collection for, and I have two beautiful Model 2s that I can't hold straight, and of course, no real too discerning Sega CD fan lives without his beautiful XI to actually play his games on. But more importantly, the Sega CD is truly a fascinating beast in gaming. The library that it shares is full of games that range from incredibly good ports to incredibly shitty ports, FMV games that no one would ever want to play again to FMV games that I think are some of the best titles in the system. And that's not even talking about working designs, beautiful contributions to the world, the weird, obscure Japanese games that we got, all of the oddball, just random exclusives we had. The Sega CD library is one of the most unique libraries on any video game system, add on or otherwise, that I've ever had the personal experience to do. And now that I have every single game on its library, I can tell you that, genuinely speaking, it's one of my favorite libraries in any video game system. And with that in mind, I have finally devised a top 20 of my personal favorites that I'd like to share with you today. Because, well, frankly, it deserves to be told. Of course, mind you, this is not a normal top 20. It's a personal thing. There are going to be games on here you're going to go, how the hell did you include that over blank? And my answer is simply, because I liked it better. What are you going to do? Also, one other note. Uh, it's one game per franchise. I I'm not saying I have to note that for any particular reasons, but I'm just saying ahead of time, it's one game per franchise, not, not naming any names. Just so you get the point. But with further ado, further so without further ado, here is the top 20 best Sega CD games, according to Gunstar. FMV is practically synonymous with the Sega CD, and this was warranted as it was marketed with this tech at the forefront. As such, many of the FMV games remembered for their cheesiness and generally poor quality. However, a few FMV games like Road Avengers and Time Gale were liked since they were basically Dragon's Lair clones or QTE games, and they were animated as opposed to live action. However, what if the cheesiest live action FMV game took this approach to gameplay instead of the others like Night Trap and Mad Dog McCree? You would get Wirehead. This would easily be the weirdest choice on the list, and honestly, it's all because the acting and set pieces are so bonkers. It truly is the best example of what people tend to think of when they think of the Sega CD. You control Ned Hubbard, who is now known as Wirehead, after a doctor helped him with an experimental treatment to enhance his body after an undisclosed accident. Moreover, it allowed another person to manually override and control the person, which is where you come in. After the doctor mentioned his kidnap, the organization out to take the tech for evil purposes is out to hunt Ned down, and you are his last hope of getting out of it alive. The gameplay is super simple, it's all just quick time events, but it's the way the story plays out that makes it amazing. One minute you are punching berries in the forest, and then immediately end up in an old west saloon, and then you end up in a gunfight on a giant boat. And that's not even the half of it. The insanity this game brings is fantastic, and while it may only last about an hour once you figure out the path, it's an hour you won't forget. It's all the best elements of the FMV games distilled into one Sega CD game. For a console built on CD hardware in the early 90s, Sega CD didn't have a lot of point-and-click adventure games. You had Snatcher, which is more visual novel than a traditional point-and-click, and some ports like Sherlock Holmes, Willy Beamish, and The Secret of Monkey Island. However, hidden among those ports was possibly one of the most underrated point-and-click games ever made, Rise of the Dragon. Originally developed for computers by Sierra Dev's Dynamix, the port to the Sega CD was done by Slifheed and Lunar Dev's Game Arts, and was the only console version released. The game is set in a cyberpunk version of Los Angeles, where you take on the role of Blade Hunter, a former police officer turned private eye. When the mayor's daughter turns up dead and mutated after experimenting with a new drug, Hunter is called in to track down those responsible. This leads Hunter into the seedy underworld of the city, and stumbling onto something much bigger than he imagined. Like many games at the time, the game delved into mature subject matter. 
Games like Phantasmagoria and Harvester and other games generally felt like they were trying to push the envelope or become edgy or look for controversy for its sales. Whereas this game, it really felt like the mature subject matter was a service to the story and not just there for the sake of being there. Most importantly though, it was told and written well, especially through the Sega CD's new voice acting, a feature the computer releases didn't have, which brought the story that much more to life, and had some serious voice acting chops behind it, like Cam Clark, the voice of the original Leonardo from TMNT, and Liquid Snake voicing the main character Blade Hunter. Hey, greetings, officer! I'm not a police officer. However, it wasn't just the story and its presentation that this game pushed the envelope for. The game had its own in-game timer, and by doing certain actions, you could delay the Mastermind's plan happening. And without doing this or wasting too much time, you would get a game over. It made you think about your choices more than other point-and-click games. Not only that, not unlike many other point-and-clicks, it had a few arcade-style segments of gameplay, which many found annoying and poorly implemented in these kind of games. While by no means perfect, these segments are still kind of a nice break, and they aren't so frustrating that you'll want to give up immediately. But again, they aren't perfect, and by no means are a substitute for a real action game. Also unlike other point-and-click games, the puzzles here had multiple solutions, and the way you solve them can influence the plot. Also, the way you talk to people is important, as screwing up dialogue can also render the game unwinnable, as they may not be willing to help you, depending on how you talk to them. This of course doesn't even mention the well-done puzzles, the comic book-inspired windows and art style, and the smooth controls made better with a Sega Mega Mouse. If you ever need a new mystery to solve, Rise of the Dragon is a case you should take. Remember just a few moments ago when we mentioned Road Avenger when discussing Wirehead? Well, it's on the list too. Road Avenger is the best in its class of the FMV games on the system, a relentlessly difficult and entertaining anime romp to avenge the death of your love by the destruction of everything with your car. Not just your enemies, everything. The game looks fantastic for the Sega CD, does a great job of keeping a breakneck pace, and unlike many other games in the system, the cutscenes and gameplay weave effortlessly together to keep the blood pumping and you on your toes. Unlike the So Bad It's Good of Wirehead, Road Avenger was basically an amped up Dragon's Lair, and truly one of the best of its kind. If you need an adrenaline rush, Road Avenger is the perfect shot in the arm. <laughs> Heart of the Alien is an odd case, a sequel to the beloved Another World, or out of this world in the US, that was exclusive to the Sega CD. An odd case for a cult classic that was released for basically every system, and yet its sequel was only on the Sega CD, not even a PC version. It was well received upon release, but it's generally seen as a weaker game than its original, but not bad. The Sega CD is full of odd games like this, and yet these facts aren't enough to put it ahead of its game's spiritual successor Flashback, which is the game we're actually talking about. Even though this game was just an upgraded port, Flashback The Quest of Identity still holds up today as one of the most unique experiences of that console generation. A fantastic adventure puzzle game with a gorgeous animation style, wonderful music, and a fantastic world and setting. In it, you play as Conrad B. Hart, a man who wakes up in a jungle with no memory and finds a hollow cube, telling him to meet his friend Ian in New Washington after informing him of his name. And that's all you'll know to start with. From here is a series of events that will not only bring you closer to the truth about your past, but the great danger the human race is about to face. With a more action-oriented style compared to its spiritual predecessor, Another World, Flashback delivered an engrossing world with memorable moments like the Death Tower game show and the encounter at the Paradise Club with the aliens. The story may not be hugely original, but the way it was told was great. The Sega CD version is the only one to have voice acting in the game which brought the story to life and like any other version. You must have a permit in order to work. You can get one at the administration center. And a brand new original soundtrack done for this version was a fantastic addition and really up the scale of the cinematic experience, and one that still continues to be fantastic to this day. And games like Uncharted and Quantic Dreams may owe a thanks to for being the predecessor to the cinematic video game. <laughs> NHL 94 is unlike any other sports game I can think of. I can't think of any specific iteration of a sim-style sports game that is still as beloved and known by year like NHL 94 was. As someone who grew up with the game, it's easy to see why. Deftly bridging the gap between sim and arcade, the game was easy for anyone to pick up and get into, but gave lots of options to those who knew the game and wanted a realistic version of their favorite sport. Of course, it wasn't just the gameplay that was 100% solid, but it was the presentation that also elevated the game. 
Each team had their winning goal music, the stadiums and teams were more accurate, and just in general looked better overall than the original NHL hockey. Much like NBA Jam, the Sega CD version doesn't add too much that breaks new ground, but it's the most polished version for sure, with better audio quality and some archival footage for fans. And it's still one of the greatest sports games ever made, still being played by fans today, and completely deserving of its spot on the list. Road Rash is one of the finest racing games from the 16 and 32-bit era. And while the game was apported to a multitude of systems over the years, from the Genesis and the Game Boy to the 3DO and Saturn, the game is a beloved classic and it stands the mightiest on the Sega CD. The setup should be familiar to fans of Sega's early motorbike game Hang On, where you race across multiple courses, meaning to place fourth or better to continue moving on to the next race. You receive money after each race that you can use to purchase upgrades, upgrades you'll need as the opponents get faster and more aggressive and the courses get trickier and longer. What made this game unique from other racers at the time was the ability to attack your opponents during the race, and being able to knock your opponents out as well as getting knocked out yourself, as opposed to racing past them. On top of that, long before Need for Speed came around, the cops would sometimes chase you down since it was an illegal race, and you could even be caught and arrested. You only truly get a game over when you can't afford to repair your motorbike or pay your fines, which can lead you to make risky calls about how much you want to spend on upgrades up to that next race. While later ports would look vastly superior, I dug having the info in the bottom half of the screen in the Sega CD and Genesis versions, as opposed to the cleaner but more plain 32-bit ports. The most important part of the Sega CD, however, was the game's soundtrack. All the CD-based versions had a licensed soundtrack, which was new for the time, that included Soundgarden and other alternative acts. However, only this version had the music during the gameplay, one of the earliest games to do so. Having Rusty Cage blaring while you beat the crap out of your rivals was amazing, and is the final nail into this game's slot on this list. Much like its parent system, the Sega Genesis, the Sega CD is known for its great shooters. Not only are they fantastic, it's the fact that there is a huge variety of shooters for anyone to enjoy. Take the first shooter on our list, Kyle Flying Squadron. Ignoring the astronomical price point, Kaio is a simple, cute em up style shooter. It plays like a traditional side-scroller, but its theme and graphics are generally cuter and more colorful, include a more lighthearted tone, and generally have quirky enemies, power-ups, and ships compared to the more brooding, darker, and edgier shooters, even if they're just spacey. Kaio is no exception. From its anime cutscenes full of goofy comedy and generally over-the-topness, to the oddball peppy music, the larger-than-life bosses, and adorable dragon with mini dragon helpers, it's hard not to get sucked into Kaio's charm. However, the game still deals out a fun, challenging shooter. The game may not be as relentless as other shooters on the system, but it can still beat you down when it wants to. It certainly is style over substance, but the gameplay is solid enough to keep you engaged through to the end of seeing what weirdness lies in wait for you next. Kaio is a great little shooter that can easily steal your heart with its cuteness, if it doesn't steal your wallet first. Sometimes you can tell when a slight bit of bias may come into your picks. This is part of the fun of these lists, and no choice may be more personal than Mickey Mania, though it has other evidence to back it up. My personal reasons are that I grew up in a family that loved Disney, my mom has always been a fan of Disney since she was a child, and she passed that love on to me. From the theme parks, to the movies, to the cartoons, she just loved everything about it. And one of the very few ways that we bonded early on with my love and her loves combined was playing Disney-themed video games, and no game captured that spirit better than Mickey Mania. Mickey Mania is a solid platformer that, unlike many other games like Castle of Illusion and the Magical Quest series, took you through Mickey's old cartoons as opposed to using original assets for the game. From Steamboat Willie to the newest short at the time, The Prince and the Pauper, Mickey travels through these old cartoons because... Well, the game really doesn't tell you why, but that isn't really important. To the gorgeous animations that perfectly emulated the character, thanks to real Disney animators working on the game, to fantastic platforming that was fun for younger kids, but still challenging enough for adults, and it also had a beautifully made soundtrack. Add in the minor improvements this game had over the Genesis port, like voice clips for Mickey, longer and even an extra level, and even more fluid and better animation, and you have the best version of the game. 
Even the European-exclusive PlayStation version, with its extra stage segment, suffered from a poor balance retweaking to make it harder, leaving the Sega CD version as the best version. Yep, that's all you need to hear to know what's next. Not a lot needs to be said about what makes NBA Jam one of the best sports games ever made and worth picking up on whatever console you own, even the Sega CD. The additions were minimal, updating the player roster before NBA Tournament Edition came out, and adding a bit of random cutscene FMVs, but most importantly up in the sound quality providing plenty of extra awesome commentary. Of course, even being such a simple port of a game you could have bought on the Genesis doesn't make it any less deserving of being in the top tier of Sega CD games. It's a testament to just how well the game has aged over 20 years later, still being as good to play as it was way back then. The game's frantic pace, 4 player multiplayer, and crap ton of secrets to find have kept NBA a staple of not only the resurgence of arcades, but still a staple of game nights everywhere, and this fantastic Sega CD port was just another notch in its belt. <coughs> One aspect that many forget about the Sega CD is that it was known for having the definitive version of many popular titles on its system. Some continue to be the best versions, and some are only the best of the retro consoles, and they've since been surpassed. Final Fight CD may fall into the latter category, but damn if Final Fight CD doesn't still pack a punch. For almost a decade, this reigned as the only version of Final Fight in the US to come close to the arcade version. Besides a slightly lower enemy count and some slower animations, the game was basically arcade perfect. Unlike the Super Nintendo version, the industrial level here was present and accounted for, all three playable characters were here and not in two separate cartridges, and the game had a Red Book audio soundtrack, with voice acting even for the opening and ending. It even had an exclusive time attack mode, for what it's worth. Even if it had a bit of load times, it would soon lead to see why the series was the only one that could truly hang with Streets of Rage by being the OG of the beat-em-ups. All three characters felt unique, each boss and even some of the generic enemy types are memorable, the hits and weapons all have that perfect amount of impact to satisfy the primal drum smacking down on tons of criminal scum. Final Fight in the end, arguably, tends to be held the second fiddle to Streets of Rage. This gives us the best of both worlds, and gave us even more ammo against Nintendo fanboys at the time. It's still an undeniable classic, and even with Streets of Rage around, we welcomed it with open arms as another great Capcom arcade port from Sega, and being an early title to prove that the Sega CD had more than FMV going for it. Hey, hope you all enjoyed part one. If you're looking for more Sega CD goodness, you can click either one of these two videos to check out another video I did on some Sega CD stuff that you're not going to see on the countdown for the most part, and hopefully you'll come back next week to check in for part two we do number 10 through number one. I mean, you're this far in now, you basically might as well finish it, right? Right. <laughs>